Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. My uncle and I, who is only two years older than me, were playing on the hay bales that his neighborhood always stored in the field between their houses in the spring before gardening time. Each house stands on a hill with a larger hill behind them. The whole area was one huge field with a few trees here and there until you got to the top of the big hill in the back. That is where the forest begins. I was looking at the trees while my uncle was getting something when I noticed a large bipedal figure leaning against one of the trees. My first impression was that it was a bear until I noticed that the arm that it was leaning against the tree with was straight out at a 90 degree angle to the body. After a few more seconds of looking, I realized it was roughly human shaped, but very large. It was so far away, I couldn't say how big exactly. But, having seen a truck on a hill before, it had to be at least seven feet tall. I observed it for several minutes before my uncle returned. I pointed it out to him, and we watched it together for several more minutes. We finally became too frightened to stay and ran to the house to tell his dad, my step-grandfather. He didn't believe us until the family realized we were scared stiff. He got a pair of binoculars and went out behind the house to look, but the creature had left. It occurred to me later that the creature had been watching us play for an indeterminate time before I noticed it. Other family members have heard strange screaming sounds in the area and have had an ominous sense of being watched. It was a sunny late afternoon day around 5 or 6 p.m. The sun was low in the western sky, but it was still bright for an early spring day. The area is a large cleared field with forests all around. The area is also very hilly and sparsely populated north of the highway. In the early 80s, there were sightings of a tall furry biped in the outskirts of Benton and around Depot Creek. It was seen standing at one person's fence in their backyard harassing their dog. I'm not sure of the exact year. It was in 1983 or 1984. The creature was seen over three or four nights. On to the next one. When I was seven, my family lived at Little Rock AFB. At the time, there was wood behind our house and a small lake as well. After school one day, I was playing in my backyard. I looked up toward the woods and saw something squatting down next to a tree looking at me. It was covered in black hair, except on its face, and had, as I remember, a flat nose and pointed head. I was stunned. I turned and ran into my house, where I told my mom that I had just seen a gorilla. I knew that it wasn't a gorilla, but that was the only thing I could think to describe. My mom thought I was playing around and didn't really believe me. When I looked back there again, it was gone. After my family moved off base, we lived in Jacksonville proper. We lived in a residential area close to the edge of town with woods nearby. For years, there were stories of the Loop Road monster. It was said to be white in color. On to the next one. My brother and I were hunting near the Jenkins Ferry National Historic Site. He is four years younger than me. I was 17 years old, and my brother was 13. It was early morning before sunup. We were squirrel hunting with my dad. When we left the truck, my dad went down in the woods by himself, and me and my brother walked down this gravel road deep in the forest, where there was water on both sides of the road. The sun was coming up, and we were standing in the road, waiting for it to get light enough to go into the woods, I was looking down the road toward the sun. On the left side of the road, under a big tree, was a very tall, at least eight feet, figure covered with hair from top to bottom. It was on the side of the road in the tree line. It then 
stepped on the edge of the road, I noticed that he wasn't wearing any clothes or carrying a gun, and it was too big to be a human. Me and my brother squatted down in the tall grass next to the road. The figure then came to the edge of the road and just stood there. I looked straight up, and he looked to his left. We were on his right side, and by then we were in the grass and he did not see us. My brother took aim at him with his twenty two caliber rifle. It always jams after firing just one shot. I asked him what he was doing. He said, that is not a person, and if he comes this way, I'm going to shoot him. I told my brother, don't shoot, the gun will jam. I had a single barrel 16 gauge shotgun with squirrel shot. We just sat there in the tall grass and watched the figure walk across the gravel road. The animal took at least three steps, and he was across the road. Its arms were very long, and I noticed that there was long hair hanging from his arms. Its foot slid when it stepped off the road and onto the right-hand shoulder. Then one foot began sliding, causing the animal to lose its balance for a second, nearly falling backward, just before it stepped into the water. Once in the water, it started walking into the woods and never seen me or my brother. We got up and ran back to the truck. The truck was locked, but I knew the wing window on the passenger side didn't lock. I opened up the wing window and reached in and opened the truck door, and me and my brother got inside. We started honking the horn until my dad came out of the woods. We told him what we had seen. He said he did not see the creature, but he heard something very large walking through the woods, breaking sticks and limbs. My dad took the safety off his shotgun and waited and listened for a little while before getting back in the truck. We left the area and never went back there to hunt again. It has taken me all these years to tell the story. My brother and myself have told people in our family and they think we're crazy. But me and my brother know what we saw that day. I've been all over the world and I've hunted in a lot of different states. But I've never seen anything like this before or after that day. While my brother and I were standing on the gravel road, the sound of all the ground frogs and crickets stopped. There was no noise, just silence. That's when I saw the very large, hairy creature about 50 yards to my left under a big tree on the side of the road. I've never seen anything in the woods that I could not explain, and also my brother witnessed the big creature. I would say we saw Bigfoot, and to this day, we have never returned to hunt in this area. It was early Sunday morning, just before full sunrise. The area was heavily forested with very large areas of wetland and swampland. On to the next one. Four teenagers, Sandra, 13, Gail, 16, Ricky, 17, and Jesse, 19, had taken some rubbish to a dump off Gravel Pit Road. There was a sudden heavy thunderstorm, and they waited in their car in the dumping area for the weather to clear. They at first heard the sound of crunching gravel, then a sound like a woman's scream, followed by a growl. Looking through the rear window in the light cast by the trail light and the lightning flashes, the group saw a dark, hairy creature seven to eight feet tall with glowing red eyes. There was a foul odor like rotting flesh surrounding them. The creature peered through the rear view window and Ricky, the driver, took off in a hurry. Within the next few hours, they saw the creature or its twin three more times crossing the road in front of their car and later at Ricky's house where it ambled off into the woods. A search of the dump the following day found an oversized footprint with claws instead of toes. There were several sightings in the area over May and June. On to the next one. Two boys, 15 and 11 years old, were riding on a motorcycle trail near Bayou de Lutra just off Sunset Road in Union County, Arkansas, south of El Dorado. The two boys were deep in the woods, disobeying their parents' wishes, and just crossed a creek when the eldest boy looked west into the sun and saw an eight-foot-tall black humanoid figure behind a tree trunk. 
and then jumped behind it. The beast was thin for its size, and its hair hung close to its body. Both boys fled the scene on their bikes and eventually heard the pounding of feet behind them, and the oldest boy stated that he felt the vibration of the footfalls through his handlebars. On to the next one. My name's James, and I'm a former full-time orthopedic surgeon. I say former because I left that life far behind me a few years ago. Though I'm now practicing again, but in a much more limited and less stressful way. There were a number of reasons I quit my practice, but they basically revolved around an incident that happened when I was staying in a house on the western side of the Tetons in the little village of Alta, Wyoming. In case you don't know, orthopedic surgeons specialize in the musculoskeletal system. I was the guy you'd see if you needed a knee or hip replacement, ACL repair, shoulder replacement, well, you get the idea. My life began changing in a major way when my wife, Laura, decided she wanted a divorce. Now, being a doctor is not an easy profession, and even after you get through all the rigors and long days of medical school and your internship to where you can actually start practicing, you hope things will ease up a bit, but they sometimes get even more stressful. After a number of years of hardly ever seeing me, I think my wife finally decided that things would never turn around, which was probably true. Laura and I went to college together. She studied to be a teacher, so she was out of college long before I was. And her teaching job made it possible for me to get through medical school. I was appreciative of that at the time and still am. Once I started actually working as a doctor, she also worked long days as a teacher. But she got summers off and I didn't. She had hoped I could at least take some time off each summer to do some of the things that normal sane people do who don't work 60 to 80 hours a week. But I was just as busy as ever, as the season made no difference. Actually, summers for me were even busier, as that's when everyone tended to hurt themselves doing outdoor activities. Laura knew that my being a doctor would require long hours of work and sacrifice. But I don't think she really understood just how much I would be away from home. In all honesty, I didn't either. Or I might have chosen a different profession, but it was what it was. And I was a dedicated doctor. I had hoped the money would ensure a good lifestyle for both of us, and it did, but I seldom had the time to actually enjoy it, yet alone see my wife except for coming and going. Anyway, after a number of years of this, Laura finally got kind of used to it, or so I thought. We got along great, even though I didn't see her very much. So, you can imagine how gobsmacked I was when she had me served with divorce papers. The day I was served, I came home to find my wife gone, and a note saying she would be back at some point to get her stuff, and that I was to either sell the house and split it with her, or somehow make restitution, especially since she supported me through medical school. Her divorce attorney would be in touch. Well, I went from being a fairly secure guy, or so I thought, to being an instant emotional wreck. It was only then that I realized how much I depended on Laura for my inner stability. She was my rock, and even though I didn't get to spend much time with her, she was always there for me, until all of a sudden she wasn't. Later, I realized there'd been a lot of red flags and warning signs, and she'd even told me over and over that she was unhappy and felt our marriage was collapsing, but I guess I just refused to believe it. Besides, there really wasn't anything I could do about it, or so I thought, because my job required long hours, many of which were spent doing paperwork. I became so distraught that I actually had trouble functioning. After a week of stumbling through my appointments 
and surgeries, I finally went to the hospital administrator where I worked and had a long talk about what was going on and how I needed to take some time off. I took a leave of absence a week later. I had no idea why or where I was going or what I was doing, but I knew I needed to go somewhere to get my head back together. I'd been so busy that I had a few friends and the ones I did have were mutual friends with my wife and I didn't feel comfortable talking to them about what looked to be the end of my marriage. But I did have one good friend, Gary, a fellow doctor, and I had a couple of long conversations with him. He said I needed to get away from everything and clear my head and figure out what to do. I had no idea where to go. So I asked him to book me a place that was quiet and had mountains or desert or something where I could maybe go out and hike and get away from everything. Gary loved to travel and he remembered a house where his wife had wanted to go a couple of years before for a short vacation, though they'd ended up booking something else. He got online and checked and sure enough, it was open. So he booked it for me. I was living in Denver at the time, and this house was near Alta, Wyoming, on the west side of the Teton, the opposite side from Jackson. It wasn't cheap, and this was way bigger than I needed, but the setting looked perfect. It was an old, historic log house with a big central great room with tall, two-story gable windows and a wing on each side with the bedrooms and bathrooms and a nice big kitchen on the back side of the big living room. Every window had a spectacular view of either the Tetons to the east or the Big Hole Mountains to the south. Big trees lined the big expansive lawns and framed the views of the Tetons, which were so close you almost felt like you could reach out and touch them. The house sat on 50 acres at the very edge of the Jedediah Smith Wilderness, which made it very special but which also made it very accessible to a creature I later suspected came from that same wilderness, which I'll get to shortly, though I just as soon forget it. I was soon driving from Denver to Alta, first through Salt Lake City, then to Idaho Falls and over to Driggs, Idaho, which is a small town of maybe 1,500 people. I instantly liked Driggs, which was quite a contrast to Denver. Alta's only a few miles past Driggs and is in the most beautiful setting imaginable. It's actually in Wyoming, but it's the only town in Wyoming that you can't get to from Wyoming, and that's because it's on the backside of the Tetons. After I got there, I scaled it on Google Earth, and the top of the Grand Tetons was only 20 miles from the log house I was renting. I'll never forget driving up the long lane to the house between grassy lawns lined with aspen and pine trees, and then unloading my stuff into the foyer and looking out those huge two-story windows. My jaws dropped, and I felt like I was in a dream. There, in all their glory, were the Tetons. The house stood at the opening of a long valley between tall hills with thick forests, with no close neighbors. Later, that dream turned into more of a nightmare, but at the time, I was totally enthralled with the house and the views. And so I settled in and felt fortunate to have this refuge, happy that I was able to afford to stay there. Gary had booked it for one month, and I knew it would take longer than that for me to get my life back together. But I hoped I could at least come to grips with what was going on. I hadn't seen nor talked to my wife since before I was served with divorce papers. Okay, so here I was in this really beautiful setting. The house itself was over a hundred years old and had some very nice touches, but it wasn't a huge trophy house. It was more just a really nice log house that was very comfortable and had been remodeled to have this huge, great room with big windows. I couldn't decide which wing I wanted to stay in, the one with the master bedroom and bath, which was on the back side of the house, or one of the two that faced toward the front side of the house, which had a futon 
and the other which had two bunk beds. I opted for the master bedroom, which was large and comfortable. The curtains were open, and I remember looking out at the dark shadows of the trees, feeling like I was on the edge of the wildest wilderness I'd ever been around. I unpacked, then went into the kitchen and looked around a bit. I knew I would have to do a grocery run the next day, but I was hoping there might be some basics. I really wanted a cup of hot tea, but what I found instead was some hot chocolate, so I made a cup of that instead, then went and sat in the leather recliner that faced toward the big windows toward the Teton, then watched the most spectacular sunset. It was soon extremely dark, and there was absolutely no light pollution. And as I looked out that big window, I could make out far away dark teal shapes that I figured must be the tops of the Tetons, as I could see where the stars began just above. There were no curtains on these big windows, making you feel as if you were actually outside. The stars took my breath away. There were so many that were so brilliant and sparkly. I can't even describe it, but it was a sight that I will never forget. I sat there for a while, just taking it all in, kind of having forgotten my divorce for a bit until something flew into my hair and buzzed around, making me jump up from my chair. I turned on a light and realized it was a fly. I brushed it off and thought nothing of it. Who would think anything about a fly being in their house? It was mid to late October, the time when bugs try to get in from the cold. I was tired and not just from the trip, but also from trying to make my last week at the hospital as productive as possible. I was actually exhausted, though I didn't realize it at the time. I finally just collapsed into bed. The next thing I knew, it was morning, and I knew there must be a fantastic sunrise going on because the curtains had turned a kind of pinkish ruby color. I jumped out of bed and ran into the main room where I could see the sun rising over the Tetons. Clouds lit up with every shade of pink and magenta imaginable. I grabbed my camera and took photos right there in my pajamas, in the great room, again marveling at how fortunate I was to be able to stay in such an incredible place. As the sunrise faded, I decided I needed to get into town for groceries. So I got in the shower, then headed for Driggs, which was only about six miles away. It's kind of funny to be in Wyoming, and then a couple of miles later, you're in Idaho. As I was driving into town, I had a strange feeling come over me, kind of a detachment. It was the oddest sensation, almost like I'd taken some kind of drug, kind of like I was floating, and it was strong enough that I had to pull the car over and stop. I sat there for a while until my head cleared enough that I was able to go into town. Now I'm a doctor, and I'm trained in recognizing the many things that can go wrong with a human body. And believe me, there are a lot. But this seemed almost psychological rather than physical. It was definitely a physical feeling, yet it seemed like it was a form of mental detachment. I figured it was from stress. Anyway, I made it to the grocery store, got supplied up with the basics, then went to a little espresso stand and got a strong cup of coffee and drove around town in an attempt to get a feel for the place. It doesn't take long to drive around Driggs, and I was soon back at the house, where I unloaded the groceries and made myself some lunch, a sandwich with some chips. That helped a lot, and I decided the detached floating feeling I had going into town was probably from low blood sugar because I hadn't eaten for some time. In fact, I hadn't been eating much at all because when I get emotionally upset, I tend to lose my appetite. I was really tired, so I spent the rest of the afternoon just loafing, then walking around the grounds a little. I then sat in the great room for a while, reading a book on the Grand Targhee Trail, Grand Targhee being the ski area near the house. I could actually see one of the runs from the great room. I was thinking that maybe I would go up there and take a hike when another fly came buzzing in and got stuck in my hair. I knew I needed a haircut, but 
but I wondered why flies were going for my hair. I didn't use a hair gel or anything like that. I got up to get a drink of water and found the kitchen windows were thick with flies. The casement windows had lever type cranks and no screens, so I just opened them up and let all the flies out. There hadn't been any flies there earlier, so where had they come from? I wondered if maybe they'd been up in the high windows and had just now come down. But when I went to the master bedroom and saw that the windows in there were also covered with flies, I began wondering what was going on, though I didn't really think much about it. I just figured it was that time of the year. Maybe there was some kind of feedlot or something nearby. Well, that night I went into the master bedroom and went to bed early. I was exhausted, and all I wanted to do was sleep. I'd forgotten to close the curtains, and I woke up sometime in the middle of the night feeling edgy. I don't know any other way to describe it, as it felt like I was in some kind of low-level danger. I know that sounds odd, but that's how it felt, like maybe there was something outside. I lay there as still as I could, once I realized the curtains were still open, wondering if maybe a bear or something was watching me. I'd been talking with a local guy at the grocery store who told me he lived in a town near Driggs called Teutonia and had seen grizzly bears and wolves in his backyard right in town. He also told me that there was a pack of wolves that lived in the thick forest along the base of the mountain just behind my house, which made sense as there are wolves in Teton National Park and the park boundary wasn't far up the valley. So there I was, kind of scared, well, really scared, thinking a grizzly might be outside and I was too scared to even get up and close the curtain. I finally kind of rolled out of bed and walked all crouched down over to the windows and pulled the curtain shut. I then decided to sneak into the other wing of the house and sleep in one of the other bedrooms just in case there was something out there that had seen me. That way, it wouldn't know where I was. That's how scared I was that I would even think like that. In fact, I grabbed my keys and it even occurred to me to maybe just get in my car and drive away. But as I started creeping in the dark from one wing to the other, I realized I would have to cross the great room with all those huge floor to ceiling windows. I knew whatever was out there would be able to clearly see me. So I kind of crawled into the kitchen where I wouldn't be seen then sat on the floor and just waited. After being uncomfortable and cold for about an hour, I decided I had to do something different. I crawled back to the master bedroom and got in bed. Once I was down under the covers, I gradually went back to sleep. I woke the next morning, the sun shining directly in my eyes. The sun was at an angle where it would come up over the middle Teton and the bedroom window looked out in that direction. I was disoriented, not sure where I was, then remembered and watched the sun slowly come up, washing out the shadows from the giant crevices up on the mountainside. It suddenly dawned on me that I had closed the curtains the night before. As I sat there in bed, I recalled clearly how I'd felt during the night, and I was positive I'd closed all the curtains. So why was one now open? to where the sun was in my eyes. I finally decided I must have not closed it all the way. I was so exhausted that it was something I could have possibly done, but it left me feeling unsettled. It was late, maybe 9 a.m., and I was hungry. So I headed for the kitchen, making myself a cup of coffee and some breakfast. I was braced to see the windows full of flies, but there was not a single one. It was a beautiful day, and after breakfast, I walked around the grounds and down the lane to the main road, which led on up to the Grand Targhee Ski Hill and to hiking trails in the Teton Valley. There in the shadows of the mighty Tetons, the place was just beautiful. And I wondered why I'd been so edgy during the night. I finally decided it was because I wasn't used to being alone. This made me think of my wife, and an overwhelming sadness came over me. 
I wanted so badly to call her, but she'd block my calls and any other way I had to get a hold of her. I can't tell you how forlorn I felt. I went back inside and made a cup of tea, and I basically sat in the big recliner all afternoon and evening until the sunset covered the Tetons with Alpenglow. Then a black darkness fell on everything, including me. I finally got up and turned on some light, but I once again felt uncomfortable sitting in the guest room with no curtains, with the inky blackness outside, the glass windows being the only thing separating me from an imaginary pack of wolves. So I retreated to the master bedroom where I made sure the curtains were closed and even closed the bedroom door. I then crawled into bed, finally drifting off to sleep. I woke in the middle of the night to the strangest sound, and I didn't move, trying to figure out what it was. I thought for the longest time that it was some kind of strange electrical buzzing, and I wondered if maybe I shouldn't get up and get in my car and sleep, for maybe the house's electrical system had somehow gone haywire. I even wondered if the house might burn down. The sound was coming from the guest room, and I finally got up and cracked the door a little. I couldn't see anything, but I instantly knew what it was. The sound of thousands of flies buzzing around in the dark. Now we all know flies are quiet at night and don't generally fly around, but there were obviously flies buzzing around the great room in enough quantities that it actually woke me up. I didn't know what to do, wondering if I hadn't maybe lost my mind. How could there be so many flies all of a sudden? Where would thousands of flies hang out during the day? The only thing I could come up with was they were way up high in the peak of the two-story room, but it just didn't make sense. I finally went back to sleep as there was nothing else I could do. When I got up the next morning, I carefully opened the bedroom door but I didn't see any flies buzzing around. But sure enough, the kitchen windows were filled with them, so I again let them out. Were they going out during the day and then somehow finding their way through some hole in the shinking and coming back in at night for the warmth? It was a puzzler, and it was beginning to detract seriously from my enjoyment of the house. And what didn't help was seeing a card from an exterminator in the basket in the kitchen. Obviously, the problem wasn't new. As I again sat in the recliner drinking coffee and watching the sunrise over the Tetons, it dawned on me that my time was passing quickly and I had no idea where I would go next. Other than the flies, I was starting to kind of like the house and the feeling of being on the edge of the wilderness. Though at night, it was unsettling and felt too primal. I wanted to go out and look at the stars but I was too afraid, picturing wolves hanging out by the door with grizzly bears and mountain lions waiting for me. So, as the days went on, I gradually got a little more used to living right at the edge of the wildland, in the last house before the huge Jedediah Smith wilderness. During the day, looking out at the thick forest and steep mountain ramparts filled me with a sense of awe, but at night, it gave me a feeling of trepidation and even fear. I remember going through all the drawers everywhere, looking for bear spray, though I never found any. I guess I must have been getting rested up because I decided to drive on into town again and looked around some more. I drove to a wetland just past Driggs where moose supposedly hang out, and sure enough, I did see several. One had a huge rack, and I tried to get a picture of it, but it was too far off. I then drove on to the other side of the valley towards the Big Hole Mountains and then to the small town of Victor. It was a beautiful sunny day and I really enjoyed the drive and getting out and taking some pictures. And I stopped in Victor and got a nice takeout lunch from Medelli. I then went to the park there and ate, kind of enjoying seeing people and watching the kids at the playground. It then dawned on me that I was actively trying to stay away from the log house. The thought of going back brought on a sense of loneliness and edginess. Thinking along those lines made me stop at a small general store and buy a can of bear spray. 
Well, though I felt reluctant, it was almost dark, so I headed back. When I got there, I turned on all the lights and felt a little more comfortable in the great room. Curtains or not, I started looking through the magazines on the coffee table and found a small book I hadn't noticed before. I opened it, realizing it was a guest register and started reading some of the entries, most of which were pretty typical, things like we had a great time, beautiful views, we'll be back, that kind of thing. But as I kept reading, one entry really struck me. It said, thank you for letting us use your beautiful house in the most beautiful setting. My family and I come back to the fly house every year and we'll be back again next year. The fly house? That really struck me. So the flies weren't anything new. I opened the book again and looked at the date the note had been written and seeing it was in June, I was puzzled because flies just don't come inside like that except in the autumn. Somehow the house was a refuge for flies. I didn't really see that many around during the day except on the kitchen windows which I would open and that would be it for the day although I occasionally would see one or two here and there. But the fly house? What a strange thing to call someone's resort rental. I turned on the television thinking I'd find something to watch but I've never been a big TV watcher so that didn't last long. Besides I was beginning to feel unsettled and edgy again, and I wondered if it wasn't from feeling like a sitting duck in the great room with all the lights on and huge windows everywhere. I decided to again retreat to the master bedroom, but yet it too was starting to feel kind of dark. I remembered again finding the curtains open, plus I hadn't slept that well in there. I decided to go hang out in one of the other bedrooms. The bedroom for the futon actually felt kind of secure and I think it was because it was on the side of the house right next to the driveway. There weren't any wild areas or anything out the window, just a driveway and a grassy lawn. So I got a book and went in there and made myself comfortable. I started feeling like it was time to go to bed, but I felt reluctant to go back to the master bedroom. So I got my pajamas and basically moved into the futon room. I slept really well that night and the edgy feeling seemed to go away and I didn't wake up to the sound of flies buzzing. Well, in spite of the pleasant night, the next day everything basically came crashing down. I made the mistake of trying to get a hold of Laura even though she left me a letter telling me not to contact her. I just couldn't help it. I felt that if I could just talk to her, maybe we could fix things up. Her letter had said, you were never around to talk to me when I needed you, so don't bother trying to call me when you realize this is over. I'm really sorry, but you had lots of warnings that our marriage was failing and took no steps to do anything. Don't contact me. I knew she'd blocked me on her email and phone, so I ended up calling her brother, Ralph. Well, Ralph and I had been friends and he did talk to me for a little bit, but I can't say I liked what he told me. He basically said that he was sorry things had come to this, but Laura had asked him not to give me any kind of information about where she was or what she was doing. I was pretty much dumbfounded. I told Ralph so, asking if she thought I was going to stalk her or something. I then realized I was doing exactly what she'd asked me not to do trying to find out where she'd gone. I told Ralph I was sorry and wouldn't bother him again. Well, I felt numb. There's no other way to put it except to say that my denial was now totally gone. I finally had to come to grips with what was going on. My beautiful, wonderful wife had left me, and not only had she left me, but she didn't even want to be friends anymore. I figured she would probably take me to the cleaners, but I really didn't care. I just go and be a bum and live in an old trailer or something. I had no interest in being a doctor again, though I had no idea how I was going to support myself otherwise. To say I was distraught was an understatement. I started pacing the floor, feeling a sense of panic that my life was pretty much over. I, at first, thought this was because I loved Laura, but after a while, I began to realize that, to me, she represented security. 
and I was basically like a little kid inside. It was kind of a shock to realize how much I depended on her for everything. No wonder she'd left me. It wasn't an equal relationship. Sure, I provided her with everything she wanted, a nice house and nice vehicle, and she could travel the world. But I wouldn't be there with her because I was too busy working. I then had the thinking feeling that I had a serious problem. One, that I'd hid under the guise of being a busy doctor because it worked so well, but the truth was, I was a workaholic. I used my work to hide from reality and my own emotions. I sat in that big leather recliner for hours in the dark, and I no longer cared if something was looking at me. I just didn't care. I was beside myself and didn't know what to do or where to go. I started crying, and I cried and cried and cried, feeling sorry for myself. Then that turned into a feeling of hopelessness. At that point, I began sobbing out loud, and the sobbing turned into a wailing sound. I sounded like a wounded animal, and it gradually dawned on me that there was something outside. I couldn't see it, but I could hear it, and it sounded just like me. It was also wailing. I can't tell you how quickly I went from total utter despair to total utter horror. Whatever it was, I could see its eyes shining, and they were up off the ground a good eight feet. It was a giant grizzly bear or something. I froze. It had glowing red eyes looking in at me, and I knew it could see me, even though it was dark inside. All I could think of was that I had to get out of there right then, whatever it took, that my life was in danger. I quickly grabbed my wallet and car keys, and since my laptop was right there, I also grabbed it. I was so terrified, I'm surprised I remembered anything. I ran and jumped in my car, but it wouldn't start. The battery acted like it was half dead, and I had no idea why, because I'd been driving around enough that it should have been well charged. I finally got it to turn over to my relief. As I started down the drive, I glanced back toward the dark house and thought I could see something, a dark shadow, something big and black standing near the house. I started feeling that sense of detachment again. Then I began feeling that I was being dramatic and should stay and rest and make a cup of tea. It was really strange, like the thought was coming from outside my own mind, like someone was telling me this without using words. I managed to pull myself together and get out of there. Now shaking, I drove on into Driggs and pulled up into the grocery store parking lot, where I knew I could sit surrounded by lights and people going in and out. It felt very safe. As I sat there, I realized I was scared to death. I didn't know what to do, and I felt like I'd lost my mind. I finally got out of the car and went inside, just wanting to be around people. I got a cart and slowly walked up and down the aisles, putting a few things in, just savoring the light and the people and the feeling of safety. Well, I couldn't stay in the grocery store all night, so I finally checked out and got back into my car and tried to figure out where to go. I finally went out to the edge of town where I remembered seeing a couple of motels and I got a room. I can't tell you how nice it felt to be in a motel with other people around. After I settled down a bit, I ate the sandwich I'd bought and kind of kicked back, watched the news, and felt like I was getting my bearings again. It had been a truly awful day. I'd never fallen apart like that in my entire life, and I've been through a number of harrowing events as a doctor. I felt totally depleted, and I needed to talk to somebody. So I called my friend Gary. I told him that there had been something big outside the house, and I'd gotten a motel room. Well, Gary is one of the most level-headed people you'll ever meet, and he really tried to be there for me that night. He basically talked me down, telling me that I was emotionally very sensitive because of what had happened with Laura, and I would feel better tomorrow, that I should go back out to the house the next day and look for tracks, and in the meantime, he would contact the owner and see if there was any way I could get out of the lease. 
I slept well, even when a bunch of motorcyclists revved up in the parking lot in the middle of the night. Normally, something like that would irritate me, but when they woke me up, I felt a sense of how nice it was to be in civilization and went right back to sleep. The next morning, I got up and showered, even though I didn't have a change of clothes, but I felt much better and I went back into town and got some breakfast. Gary called about mid-morning. Dan, the owner of the rental, would be out around one to meet with me and walk around the house. That sounded okay, so I headed back up the hill, making sure I didn't get there until one, as I didn't feel comfortable alone. We walked all around the house. It was hard to find anything in the grass, but we did find a couple of tracks coming in from the road to the grassy area, and they were huge, but the owner said they were bear tracks. He added that he'd had a bear come up there a few times before he turned it into a resort rental and moved into town, and there had never been an incident in that entire valley of a bear harming anyone, and as long as I had bear spray handy, I'd be fine. Well, after it was all said and done, and he left, I started thinking about this guy, and I figured he hadn't been straightforward with me at all. I actually kind of had that feeling when he was there talking to me because I was so out of kilter, I didn't trust my intuition. In spite of how I felt about him, I finally decided that it had to have been a bear, so I went back inside and tried to focus on how lucky I was to be there, right under the beautiful Teton. I would make the most of it. I talked to Gary again, and he said the owner had decided since it was just a bear that I should stay and not worry about it, and he wasn't going to refund me my money. Keep in mind that this was a very expensive resort rental, and I paid him a lot to stay there. I brought in the groceries I'd bought the night before and made myself some dinner. Then I decided to try and enjoy the setting. I went outside and walked around the grounds, watching the birds and taking some photos of the mountains. It really was a beautiful place. I felt irritated that this bear thing was ruining my enjoyment of it. I would stay and keep my bear spray handy. I walked around on the grassy stretches of lawn, not getting too far from the house and still feeling uncertain. When I saw a small white-tailed deer lying in the grass under some aspen trees, I tried to sneak up on it to get a good photo and I nearly succeeded when it jumped up and ran off. I was disappointed, and I walked on over to where it had been out of curiosity. It was then that I saw what looked like a small root cellar dug into a small hill. I could tell it was really old from the rotted logs, and I figured it was part of the original homestead. Inside was a hole wide enough to be a bare den, though I couldn't see how far back it went. It seemed mysterious and unnatural, like something had dug into the back of the root cellar, enlarging it. As I stood there, I heard a buzzing sound, and I realized the hole seemed to be the home to a bunch of flies. I could hear them buzzing around inside, and every once in a while, some would fly out. Was this where the flies were coming from? If so, how did they end up in the house? I suddenly felt like I was in danger and I turned and hurried back to the house where I fled into the security of the futon room. I would sleep there from now on. As it started to get dark, I made sure all the doors were locked, and I turned on all the outside lights, which lit up the yard pretty good. I hadn't been doing that before, mostly because I didn't want to waste electricity, so I also gathered my stuff from the master bedroom and put everything I wasn't using in my car. I wanted to be prepared, though I wasn't sure for what. I settled into the futon room, kicking back, thinking about the root cellar and the flies, then mentally counting the days I had left there and wondering where I should go next. I actually didn't even think about Laura. In retrospect, the previous day had been kind of a peak for me emotionally. It was almost as if I was starting to accept reality, as much as I didn't like it. Well, that night, things took a turn for the worse, if possible. I went to bed and slept really well until sometime in the middle of the night when I was again awakened by the buzzing noise. I lay there, awake, 
listening. So, this was the fly house, I mused, thinking of the note in the guest book. There was something about the house that attracted and also probably bred flies, which I was beginning to find pretty distasteful, especially since a couple of them had flown into my dinner, making me toss it into the trash. I could hear them flying around out there wherever they came from, and I had no intentions of opening my door. And as I was starting to doze off and was almost asleep, I was suddenly jolted wide awake, sensing the most cutting feeling of danger I'd ever felt in my life. When I was an undergraduate in Colorado, I loved cross-country skiing, and one time a friend and I were caught up in an avalanche in the mountains. I'll never forget the terror of being tumbled down the mountainside, totally helpless and knowing I was going to die, though we were lucky and managed to ride it out. And the feeling I had that night sitting in my bed in the fly house was even more terrifying than that avalanche. I've thought back about that night a lot, and I think it was because it was a different kind of terror, more than just fear, the kind of terror you feel when you're dealing with the unknown, with something that feels malevolent, and you don't even know what you're dealing with. I could hear the flies buzzing in the great room, and I could then hear the sound of something very heavy walking across the floor coming towards my bedroom door. There was no lock on the door, and I knew I was a sitting duck. My first thought was how stupid I'd been to come back and let the owner convince me all was well, when I'd known better. My second thought was how stupid I was to not listen to my intuition. My third thought was how stupid I was to worry about the money I'd spent instead of leaving immediately. Now, something was outside my door. I slipped into my shoes, then dialed 911, even though I knew there would be a good 15 to 20 minutes before anyone could possibly show up. I then remembered I had the bear spray and took off the safety, wishing I'd at least tested it and made sure I knew how to use it. I sat there on my bed, bear spray in hand, waiting for that door to open, wondering if a bear knew how to turn the knob, though something inside me said it wasn't a bear. To my shock, I immediately heard sirens coming up to the house way quicker than I'd expected. At that point, I could hear heavy footsteps as something ran across the great room. As I listened, it sounded like it had gone into the other nearby bedroom, which seemed odd. I quickly opened my bedroom door and ran outside to my car. A sheriff's pickup pulled up, lights flashing, and two deputies got out. I was so scared I could barely talk. But I finally managed to say that someone had broken into the house. The deputies got out their big searchlights and started looking all around. I waited in my car and they were soon back saying they hadn't found anything, not even tracks. Well, I was soon again in the same motel, but this time I decided I wasn't going back to the fly house. I no longer cared about the money. I just wanted out of there. So much for my beautiful refuge in the Teton. At least I felt more resigned about Laura, knowing there really was nothing I could do. Being there had helped with that, though I knew I had a long way to go. I again spent most of the day in Victor, having lunch at a restaurant there, hanging out at the park, and eventually finding a small cabin for rent. It felt great being away from the fly house with its big windows and immense feelings of wilderness. I really liked the coziness of the cabin and slept well there my first night. But the next day, I started second-guessing myself, wondering if it really hadn't just been a bear. It was then that I realized I'd left my nice Pendleton jacket at the house. I could easily buy another, but it had been a gift from Laura, and I really wanted it back. I struggled with the thought of going to get it. I didn't want to go there alone, but... Since it was broad daylight and I had my bear spray, I decided to go back. I could grab the jacket and get right back out. Once there, I unlocked the front door and went in, again noting the beautiful views from the great room. And for a moment, I wondered if I wasn't just crazy. Why would I leave this beautiful house? Maybe I'd gone over the deep end when Laura had left me. So here I was, 
back at the fly house and the windows were again covered with flies. I grabbed my jacket, then quickly walked around the house, making sure I hadn't left anything else, all the while wondering if maybe I should come back. I finally wandered into the bedroom with the twin beds, which was the only room I hadn't really been in. I had no idea why I went in there, as there was no way I'd left anything, but I guess I wanted to be sure everything was in order before I left for good. But for some unknown reason, I opened the closet door and found it was a big walk-in closet, but at its back was a deep hole that opened into what looked like a subfloor. I was surprised, for it seemed so out of place in this big, beautiful, historic house. A dirt hole in one of the closets. I stood there for the longest time, trying to figure it out, and it was then that I noticed flies were starting to come out. Lots of flies. It was like they were now coming towards the light when I opened the closet door. I also noticed a strange, musty odor that seemed almost overpowering. As I stood there, I started feeling that same odd, light-headed, disoriented feeling, and it made me feel almost dizzy, like I was going to pass out. I started walking backwards and was pulling the door closed when I noticed a big clump of dark hair hanging off one of the door hinges, as if something hairy had pushed its way through. I suddenly felt like I had mere moments to get out of there or I would die. I turned and ran. I ran through the great room, down through the foyer, and out the front door, quickly pulling it closed so that whatever was there would have to stop to open it. I jumped in my car and peeled out. As I drove away, glad to be going to my little cabin in Victor, I knew then that something was indeed there. It wasn't just my imagination or from emotional distress. There was something strange in the fly house, something malevolent and it was coming into the house from some kind of tunnel that came out at the root cellar. And whatever it was, it was so disgusting that it attracted flies. I decided I would never go back, not even to the area, even though it was close to some hiking trails in the Teton Valley. I loved my little cabin in Victor, and after a month, my friend Gary came to visit. He wanted to drive up to Grand Targhee, but I wouldn't go with him, because we'd have to drive by the fly house. I know he thought I was being dramatic, but there was no way I wanted to go anywhere near there. The divorce was soon final, and I gave Laura everything she wanted, the house and most of our investment. I just didn't care, and I hoped it would make up for my not being there for her. I wrote her a long letter and sent it to her brother, but I don't know if she ever read it, as I never heard from her ever again. Gary told me later she was dating a friend of his. The human mind is the darndest thing, because after all that, whenever I think of her, I think of being in the fly house, and I developed the association, and it wasn't a pleasant one. This actually helped me get over her, and after a few months in Victor, a nice place in Drigg came up for rent, and I decided to move there. I was living on what was left of my savings, and I finally decided I needed to get back to work, so I applied for a job at Grand Targhee on the ski patrol. I'd been up there several times, finally overcoming my fear of driving by the fly house. I enjoyed the job, though I have to admit that being on a slope with no one around kind of bothered me, but the place was so busy it was unusual to be skiing alone. I hadn't told anyone I was a doctor, but eventually word got out at how good I was at treating my injured people, as most ski injuries are torn ligaments and things I dealt with as a surgeon, but I had no desire to get back into the high-stress medical profession, and I was happy living on almost nothing. I even started making a few friends and went on a few dates, though nothing serious. They say you eventually come back to what you love, and after a couple of years, of basically being a ski bum, I saw an on-call position at the hospital in Jackson for an orthopedist. I applied and got it, and it's worked out really well, as I still have lots of time for skiing, though I'm no longer on the ski patrol. But I now make enough money to be able to start saving again, yet I don't have the high stress that goes with being a full-time doctor, 
One day, on my way to the area, I noticed a backhoe up at the fly house, and it looked like it was digging up the root cellar. Had the owner discovered what was going on, not long after, a for sale sign appeared by the long drive. I wondered why the owner was selling it, though I suspected it had something to do with the root cellar. I toyed with the idea of buying it. Maybe the creature was gone. The idea came and went in the short time it took to drive on by, and I knew I would never set foot there again. No matter how beautiful the views, the bad associations there had helped me get over Laura, and that was the only good thing to come of it. There was no way I could ever go back again. It sold, and now when I drive by sometimes, I see kids out playing in the yard with their dog. It makes me happy, for I know the creature is gone, probably back into the Jedediah Smith wilderness, where it belongs, and now the house can be the happy place it should be. And sometimes when I drive by, I wonder what the current owners would think if they knew their house had once been called the Fly House. I know I'll never be the one to tell them, that's for sure, for I have no intentions of ever setting foot on that property again. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!